Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Kirby Lambert. I'm with the Outreach and Interpretation Program here at the Historical Society. Um, this is the second program we've had today, which is a little unusual for us, but we are uh, doing these, these two programs as part of the Myrna Loy's uh, uh, Mate, or One Robe uh, Métis uh, Cultural Fest. And today at noon, when I introduced the program, I encouraged everybody to, to join the Myrna Loy tonight at 7.30 and was informed that it's sold out. So um, unfortunately, if you don't have tickets already, please stay home because they're not going to let you in. Um, but it, that should be a great event. The whole, the whole thing, I think, is a great event. Uh, Métis culture is certainly something uh, that we should all be more familiar with and, and something worth celebrating. Also a commemoration to Nicholas Vrooman, for those of you who knew him, uh, kind of the leading authority on um, much of this history and, and just an all around great guy and we lost him uh, too soon. He was a, a great resource and good friend of the Historical Society. But anyway, it is our pleasure today to present Dr. Brendan Rensing. Uh, he's the Associate Director of the Red Center for Western Studies and an Associate Professor of History at Brigham Young University in Provo. His uh, monograph, Native But Foreign, Indigenous Immigrants and Refugees in the North American Borderlands, was published by Texas A&M University Press in 2018, and the following year it won the Spur Award for the best historical nonfiction book um, that was presented by the Western Writers of America. He's authored and edited numerous anthologies, articles, book chapters, podcasts, and reviews, and he also helps um, manage events and programming, awards, and research at BYU's Red Center. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Brendan, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Kirby, um, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming. This is a real uh, pleasure and an honor. Um, it was about uh, 13 years ago or so. Um, I was a grad student, and I spent uh, a number of days here at the Montana Historical Society doing research for this book, and it's, it was fun to, to spend the day here uh, doing research for my next book project. And, the reading room looked vaguely familiar. Um, I only have very vague memories of those um, stressful days as a grad student, um, but it's, it's really been good to be back here in Montana. Um, also, I uh, would like to um, say uh, it was my pleasure to, uh, to be able to know Nicholas Ruman um, during some of that time. We uh, both were invited to Ottawa a few years back to take part in a, a, a seminar about Métis studies. And he was so kind and so generous. And uh, it was about a year after um, we were there in Ottawa together. I got a huge envelope in my mailbox, didn't know what it was, and it was his book. He just sent me a copy of uh, the book he published. Um, and he was just so generous and kind. Um, and I also was uh, very fortunate um, for a couple years to work um, as a historical consultant for the Native American Rights Fund that was working with the Little Shell Tribe. And um, I was busy researching and writing history um, for them as part of one team that was working towards recognition. And then there was the legislative team. And we both were just to see who could get it done first. And uh, the other team got it. I've never been so happy to lose a job because um, it was just so long overdue and so, so exciting. Uh, for that to finally happen. I was especially interested in that because um, in researching and writing um, this, it was my dissertation uh, and then uh, as my book, um, Little Shell Chippewas and Métis were always uh, on the edges of the story because um, there was so much overlap between um, the Crees um, that were the real primary focus of the Montana portion of this book. Um, and then um, Rocky Boy's um, Chippewas. But um, my, the manuscript was 500 pages. The publisher said I had to chop it to 300 and something. And you know, I, was really, I really wanted to add a full chapter to bring in kind of the full, more of the Chippewa story, the Little Shell, um, and the Métis story, and there just wasn't room. Um, that's something you learn when you research and write, that you, there's just never enough room. 
to, to um, put in all the things you want. You're always having to narrow focus. Um, so in any case, that's just a little, a little backstory. So uh, what I'm going to um, talk about today is about this book. Um, I do have, I brought a box full of copies that I can sell. Um, the press sells them and Amazon sells them for $40, but I can do it for $25 because I, I have a bunch from an author discount. So, um, and I can do um, cash or card or Venmo or whatever, um, or not. I don't, I, don't do, I don't do these talks to sell books. Um, I was sure that this is where the money was, was history. <laughs> and... I've been <laughs> rudely shocked to find otherwise. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, um, distills some of the main themes from this book project, uh, which looks at um, Crees in Montana uh, and Yaquis in Arizona, who both were um, considered foreign, foreign Indians, who had crossed international borders into the United States um, and then sought permanent residence um, here in the United States. And I look at them as a way to um, think differently about indigenous peoples and immigrant communities um, as they're examples of both in terms of indigenous peoples and immigrants that don't fit into the existing um, programs or policies that the United States had developed to, um, to work with native peoples or to work with immigrants. These foreign Indians, it was just not a category that the United States had thought about or was willing um, to think about. So this work pushes against a number of narratives um, that might be familiar, right? That um, uh, we, we have the, you know, these familiar stories that Native peoples were quite mobile and that after the borders were drawn, they were crossing borders back and forth. Um, but m most of them uh, were going in the other direction, crossing out of the United States. We think about Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce or other, uh, you know, Sitting Bull, others. Um, and here, here we have this weird example of Natives coming into the United States. So these examples are a little weird um, uh, for that. And this helps kind of complicate um, how we think about uh, uh, often overgeneralized idea of the American Indian experience. As here we have native peoples that were indigenous to these to Montana. They had you know, been here long before the border was drawn, but they were not part of the federal Indian system for, for years. Um, it also I'm trying to introduce a lot of new ideas into immigration studies. There's almost no scholarship on indigenous peoples as immigrants. And as I, I've traveled and done some um, international conferences with immigration and migration scholars, and it's just not on their radar, and it really, it really should be. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's move on. So we have these two case studies, um, and in many ways, they're very, very similar. Um, we have Crees uh, from Canada who cross into Montana um, in, the late, uh, in, in a major wave, in the, you know, starting in the late 1880s, although they'd been here uh, for quite a while before, um, coming f uh, for economic reasons, uh, and then later coming for political reasons as refugees seeking political asylum. Uh, and um, I compare this with the other border, and with Yaquis from Sonora, who during almost the exact same time period um, crossed north into Arizona for very similar reasons, early on for economic reasons, and then later uh, for political reasons, um, fleeing violence and coming as political refugees. Both of these groups face very mixed receptions. Um, both uh, face similar challenges of uh, ambiguous legal status, um, the threat of deportation, and in many cases, actual deportation, um, this uh, prejudice uh, against them as being foreign, something they just can never escape. And then eventually these processes of building alliances with uh, locals in Montana, in Arizona, building friendships with politicians and prominent citizens who are able to help them start to build a coalition to, to push for uh, legal residence and eventually federal recognition as, um, as American Indian tribes. So there's so much similarity in these two stories, which is why I was attracted to doing this as a comparative uh, work. Um, a big discrepancy, though, is that although they both come at roughly the same time period, um, Crees and then the Chippewas who join with uh, Crees um, receive a reservation and federal recognition about 35-ish years 
after coming as political refugees. But the Yaquis down in Arizona, it's uh, about 100 years. So if the reasons for coming were so similar, the initial timelines were so similar, uh, why this huge discrepancy in chronology? That's something I wanted to try to, to understand. So what I'd like to do is kind of do a sprint survey kind of through these histories really fast and then think a little bit about them comparatively and try to understand that um, as we read them together in parallel, do they speak to each other? Do, they, do we find something out about the Montana story by having read the Arizona story? And, um, and I, ar I argue that we do. Um, and in the end, uh, I'll wrap up by um, bringing this to the present and thinking a little bit about um, uh, things that we have going on in the modern world and um, sensitivity and awareness we need to have about immigrant communities that m might be falling through the cracks or might be um, uh, ignored be accidentally or intentionally. Um, as was the case with, with these. And perhaps I'll um, spend a little more time on the Montana side than the Arizona one. Although maybe that's the story you guys already know. We'll see. Um, so first, let's think about borders. Um, uh, I'm convinced that it's along borders where most th some of the most um, dramatic, compelling uh, human stories unfold. Um, these landscapes on the edges of empire, right? Far removed from the centers of power, um, are often simultaneously the places where empires um, have the least control, but also where they are trying to exert um, the most overt and often most violent forms of control as a way to define the boundaries of the nation, as a way to define who belongs and who does not. But it's along these edges where people often find opportunity um, and can find that by crossing, they sometimes can gain things. Um, I grew up in northwest Washington, uh, up here in Bellingham. Has anyone been to Bellingham, Washington? Um, and uh, the, the border is about 10 miles north. And I remember as a kid watching the weather reports, and they would show kind of, you know, the, like the Doppler radar with all those blobs of, like, here's a weather pattern moving in from the Puget Sound, and it would get up to Bellingham on the map, and then there was this hard line right north of my town, and just black like the void, right? And the weather would just disappear up into nothingness, as if there's nothing up there, right? Um, I, but if, if, you, if you look here, there's something really peculiar about, I think, yeah, I think I can zoom, we, can, we zoom this in. So this is, this is zoomed in, if you saw how that went. Do you see what's weird about the border here? 49th parallel, right? It goes across Boundary Bay, but then there's this weird little sp uh, spit, Point Roberts, dips south. Um, and the United States uh, didn't let Canada have it when we did the Border Commission. Um, does anyone have any idea why? Is this, I mean... So controlling Point Roberts uh, lets you control fisheries. Um, it was one of many reasons, right? But did you guys know this, that fish just... They just swim right across the international line. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought, right? But of course they do. The environment, so we come in and we've drawn these lines of these, you know, especially the 49th parallel, right? This just straight cut across the continent, right? Um, but what do we have flowing across it, right? Rivers, watersheds, mountain ranges. And with that comes uh, not just fishes, but uh, birds, bison, and people, right? They follow the landscape. Um, this is down on the southern border, and we can see these uh, mountain range that is cut north and south. So we have this weird juxtaposition, right, of the border as something that is fixed, right? But um, at the same time, it often, especially with these really straight line ones, uh, doesn't really respect the natural world. Um, well, for native peoples living on the northern plains or in the Sonoran Desert, um, the 49th parallel in the north or the U.S.-Mexican border in the south had no real intrinsic meaning for them. It wasn't a part of their worldview. Um, and in the nation-state's attempt to try to draw these borders and impose order over a chaotic world, that's what they're trying to do with borders, they want to create order, um, they often are also creating more chaos. The creation of a border invites people to transgress it because there are differences 
on either side of the border, right? Think about during Prohibition, all the rum running across the U.S.-Canadian border, right? It, so the border created this differential in where you could consume and purchase alcohol, right? Or for Native peoples, um, uh, signing treaties uh, differently on one side or the other. Um, to go across a border for a better life or economic opportunity, um, or to escape persecution or violence. So borders, um, paradoxically, are attempting to order the world, but often doing the opposite. I already mentioned briefly um, some of the native peoples who um, actively use, uh, understood the power that the border had and tried to use it in, uh, in order to escape, uh, specifically to escape the United States. So um, uh, beginning in the 1820s and beyond, we have um, Lenapes or Shawnees, Delawares, going all the way from the East Coast, eventually all the way down into Mexico. Um, Kickapoos as well from the upper Midwest um, established communities um, ac intentionally across the line in Mexico. Um, Apaches like Geronimo and others you, um, consistently used the U.S.-Mexican border as a way to raid and then to escape across, south across the line, knowing that the U.S. military wouldn't pursue them. Uh, in the 1870s, of course, we have um, Sitting Bull runs north to Canada and spends uh, what, four years at Wood Mountain. Uh, in 1877, Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce try um, to make it, um, hoping to, to join Sitting Bull. Um, so the border offered them an opportunity, and they, they you know, got within, within about 30 miles. Well, we have these two groups, um, as I mentioned, that go they go in the wrong direction. So we have to ask some really uh, weird questions. How does the United States address um, the presence of non-American Indians or foreign Indians? Um, we have questions of, well, were, was the enforcement of the two borders uh, the same or was the Canadian and the Mexican borders differently? Um, also, how did um, local non-native um, white borderland communities um, or labor markets in Montana or Arizona um, differ, and did they offer different opportunities or different realities for the natives who crossed into them? And uh, last, I, I've thought a lot in this book about how Am Americans viewed indigenous peoples from Canada differently than they viewed native peoples from Mexico. These are some of the key differences that, um, that I've kind of teased out from these stories to try to understand, uh, again, that real that big difference in chronology. And by thinking about them, we get a much richer understanding of American um, state formation, and we discovered that the U.S. had a, a huge blind spot in policies um, concerning it, in policies for immigration and policies for Native peoples, because these groups were not normal immigrants, and they also weren't normal Indians. Um, and as a result, um, they suffered for decades, and the Yaquis for almost a full century. Um, in the United States, due to a lack of consistent or clearly defined federal policy concerning them. The saddest part being that all along the way, there were very easy solutions and often very cheap solutions, which could have been pursued, but were not. Um, when we think about, um, so let's uh, walk through uh, the Montana um, story really quick. Oh, I'm sorry that you can't quite, I have like sources for all of these things, but um, it's a little, bit, a little bit fuzzy on the screen. Um, Crees and Chippewas um, both have a long uh, history in what would become the United States. Since the 17th century, both had been consistently moving westward and south from some of their homelands up towards um, Hudson Bay and uh, the Great Lakes region. Um, Lewis and Clark, right in the early 1800s, they described Crees as such. They, um, they wrote, uh, they are a wandering nation, um, are well disposed towards whites, and treat, with traders, treat their traders with respect. They might probably be induced to visit an establishment on the Missouri at the Yellowstone River. So at this early moment, Lewis and Clark are writing quite favorably about, of the Crees and saying, maybe we can get them to come down and trade with us instead of trading with Britain. So their, their commerce, their activity uh, coming south was welcomed, was encouraged by the United States. Um, by the time we get to the 1880s, however, uh, things are very different in Montana, aren't they? Um, Montana is no longer interested in attracting Cree fur traders to come across the border. First of all, the fur trade had mostly collapsed. 
But by that point as well, um, Montana and the United States was uh, aggressively moving to restrict native movements, um, forcing them to sign treaties, restricting them to reservations, and so forth. Um, concurrent, they're trying to build up um, white populations in Montana territory so that they can then transition towards statehood. And um, off-reservation, mobile native populations were not a part of that story. They were not going to be contributing um, to, to building Montana up in the way that uh, Americans wanted, uh, wanted them to. So what do they do? What does America do? Well, they try to get them to stop crossing the border. Uh, here's um, what uh, one soldier at Fort Assiniboine says, this is in 1881, uh, to his soldier says, send out as strong a force as possible under a careful officer to notify the foreign Indians to return, and here's the, the great phrase, to their own country, and so prevent them from driving game away from the hunting grounds of our own Indians. So you can see here they're, they're starting to differentiate between Indians that are Canadian, as if the Crees thought of themselves as Canadian, right? Versus, excuse me, Indians who were our own Indians, right? So they're differentiating Indians that belong and Indians that don't. Well, this leads to years of attempts by the U.S. military to restrict Cree movements to keep them um, from crossing the, the border. This is um, Gustavus Doan writing to his wife uh, just the next year in 1882. Um, Doan is a name you may be familiar with. He was later involved with the Marias Massacre, the Baker family massacre. Um, but this is what he wrote of the Crees. I was never as tired of a tribe as I am of this one. Oh, man, that's not, that's, those are harsh words. But the Crees um, were driving them nuts because they knew the land better, they could move faster, and uh, they were continually crossing the border, often engaging in um, cattle um, thieving, and then running back across the line and kind of thumb and thumbing their noses at the U.S. troops who could never quite catch them. So if you think early to that Lewis and Clark era, we had... During the fur trade, we we're trying to entice them to come down. But once kind of the settler colonial state starts building up in Montana, uh, they want them to stop at the border. So that, that early um, uh, kind of economic immigrant um, activity of them coming south is, is no longer welcome. Well, in response to this, um, one of the key um, chiefs uh, who was involved is, uh, was Big Bear. And he and many of his Cree followers eventually go back north to Canada. And they um, resisted signing uh, treaties for a number of years. And Big Bear had a, a, quite a reputation in Canada and here in, in Montana. And eventually they do go back north and they accept a treaty and reservation settlement. Um, uh, they're settled actually pretty far away from the border, which I think was intentional. Um, Canada put them a little farther north. Uh, but the, just a few years later, in 1885, um, the Métis... Uh, leader Louis Riel, um, uh, together with uh, Crees, Chippewas, uh, Assiniboine, Grovan, uh, Métis, lots of different native groups, um, rise up. And we have the Northwest Rebellion of 1885. And as a part of that, there is a massacre of white settlers um, at Frog Lake, which is where Big Bear's uh, tribe is then residing. Um, and I, I won't get into all the, the details of it. Um, Big Bear had been tr trying to prevent something like this from happening actively and wasn't able to keep all of um, his followers uh, peaceful. Um, in response to this, um, they run. And to escape prosecution and uh, potential likely execution, um, his son Little Bear um, takes a group and flees south across the border back to Montana, where they had been for most of the previous decade, while Big Bear um, stays in Canada to take the blame and to allow them to, to flee. Um, in a later recollection, Little Bear um, recalls his father saying, it said to him, Depart, my son, flee to the south at once. Across the line there shall be liberty for you. Here you can no longer, it, you can enjoy it no longer. Um, the details are a little fuzzy about how and when they cross, but um, they arrive at Fort Assiniboine. Um, Little Bear, the story goes, tries to extend his hand um, to um, uh, Colonel C.S. Otis there at Fort Assiniboine, uh, 
and he refuses and says, uh, your hands are still bloody. I, can't, I cannot shake hands with you. Because they had heard about um, Frog Lake. And um, Otis is starting to get ready to, to round them up and deport them back to Canada. And again, the documentation is fuzzy, but at some point they receive word from uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, that Little Bear's uh, Crees are going to be allowed to stay in Montana as political refugees. Uh, they're going to be granted asylum. And our understandings of refugee status, asylum status, it's not quite the same as it is today. But they weren't going to be um, forced to go back north. So what does this mean? What does it mean to be a refugee Indian? Does this, um, they're providing uh, protection for you? Does it mean that they'll be assimilated into existing, uh, you know, the federal Indian bureaucracy and given lands to settle on? Does it mean that they're going to be recognized as Indians? Uh, well, in the end, the answer was none, none of the above. Uh, nothing is done, and they're left to wander. So if you use 1885 kind of as the starting point of foreign Crees coming into Montana, it's 36 years until 1916 when they uh, gain federal recognition and finally have lands of their own to settle on. For that 36 years, they're living landless in Montana. 36 years of, of transient movements across the state, living on the edges of Montana cities, literally living in uh, the city dumps um, outside of Great Falls, Helena, Butte, and elsewhere, you know, living off the scraps and refuse that they could find, um, starving um, sometimes to death, especially in the, uh, in the winters, uh, there's epidemic diseases they suffer from. Um, native to Montana, they have decades of uh, connections here, but being denied recognition as natives and being denied integration um, into a system that existed there uh, of reservations. Um, but also lacking the economic skill set to participate in the development of Montana industry, like other immigrants, say, from Europe were doing. Right? So they weren't really fitting in either world. Ten years later, um, in 1896, um, after lots of complaining from Monta uh, local Montanans and Montanan politicians, uh, the U.S. government appropriates $5,000 to round them up and to deport them. Uh, this is done by uh, future General um, John J. Pershing, who right, led the American Expeditionary Force in World War I. Black Jack Pershing um, called that because his, he led a contingent of um, uh, Buffalo soldiers. And um, it's a brutal affair. Uh, but they round them up um, and deport them in uh, the summer of 1896. Um, I'll, I'll spare you the, the details, but I mean, there's even a story of this one uh, Cree uh, man who was so uh, terrified of, of returning north, of what would happen, that he, uh, he committed suicide uh, in full view of everyone, um, rather than, than go back north. Well, they're, de they're deported back north uh, on, in rail cars. They're put across the line and almost all of them immediately turn around and go right back to Montana, about 75-ish percent. We don't know the exact numbers. There's a popular Cree telling that they beat the soldiers back to Fort Assiniboine. <laughs> and they very well probably did. So the story of their landless, wandering, and needless suffering continues. Um, and, and the prejudice and, and vitriol that they face in Montana is really really shocking. Um, these are two cartoons um, from the Anaconda Standard in 1901, which is one of the most kind of anti-Cree uh, newspapers that there were, always, always railing on about them, right? Here, um, right, suggesting that they're all drunks, the modern Cree on the warpath to the saloon. Here, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home, right? Like, uh, you know, making fun of them, right, for the fact that they're living in destitute poverty uh, in the city dump. Uh, not, not much compassion here. So Crees are unable to establish um, kind of stable communities because they're constantly having to move around, uh, wandering and homeless. 
Uh, one recalled, uh, this is in 1911, uh, we wintered in uh, Haver, Montana in 1911. It was very hard. We were living in tents. It was cold. Um, I was just talking, uh, we have a grad student here from Bozeman, Micah, who's writing a dissertation about life on the high line, right? And how would you like to be in a flimsy tent in a Haver winter? Yikes, right? I mean, it was cold. It was very hard on the horses. They didn't have any feed. There was no hay. The horses were always shaking because of hunger. Um, one paper wrote, all the efforts to secure aid from Uncle Sam have failed, and the government has treated the half-starved band in a most shameful manner. So there are, there are a few sympathetic voices. Well, starting in the early 1900s, um, there's another group of landless Indians in Montana, um, uh, Chippewas, and associated bands of Métis. Um, under the leadership of uh, a Chippewa named Rocky Boy, as well, as well as a number of others. And there's multiple attempts by the U.S. government to settle Rocky Boy's Chippewas on existing reservations. Many of the Chippewas could establish or claim that they were born on the U.S. side of the line, even though, you know, up in the Pembina and Minnesota borderlands, it's all pretty fuzzy about, you know, exactly what side of the line people were born on because they were crossing so often. Um, but Rocky Boy uh, is working with uh, prominent Montanans. Frank Linderman is a great friend uh, of Rocky Boy and a great friend of uh, Little Bear, um, Charlie Russell, um, and others. And they, they introduce them to uh, prominent newspaper editors, prominent politicians. Um, and uh, they start uh, pushing for uh, a bill in Congress. Um, to this, there's um, incredible uh, local opposition the book goes on for, you know, ad nauseum about, uh, you know, they almost, they almost get a reservation uh, and then it's shot down. Uh, they're settled on the Blackfoot reservation and then they're kicked out. Um, it just goes on and on. Um, eventually, uh, in 1916, um, they succeed. And at the last moment... Because all along, um, Little Bear and his Crees are trying also. But they, have a, they had a much more negative reputation uh, in Montana, a lot more prejudice against the Crees um, than there were against Rocky Boy and his Chippewas. But at the last moment, uh, they're brought in with uh, the Rocky Boy effort, and they're settled together. And this is the Rocky Boy Chippewa Cree Reservation, right, south of Haver. So it's not until 1916 that they enter kind of uh, what we might think of as you know, the more familiar mainstream American Indian experience. Everything up, into, up to then was, uh, doesn't really fit into our, our narratives and our stories of what it meant to be uh, Native, um, and what the Native American experience was you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Because they were something other. Not quite Indian, not quite immigrant, refugees but ignored and not really given any support, harassed, deported, allowed to suffer and die for decades. Okay, um, let's go south um, and uh, bounce this off of um, uh, the Arizona example and then see um, how, how they compare. Um, Yaquis, um, I don't know if you guys are very familiar with uh, the history of northern Mexico and Yaquis, um, but they had, so this is, uh, here's, you know, Sonora and Chihuahua, here's the Gulf of California. And um, the Yaqui River Valley, um, uh, which we can, is, is right here. Um, the, the Yaquis were th the last unconquered indigenous population in Mexico. Um, since as early as the 1730s, um, um, Spain fought war after war uh, to try to subdue the Yaquis, and they resisted and resisted and remained independent um, all the way up into um, the late 1800s. All the while, though, Yaquis had gained a number of very valuable um, economic skills. Uh, in, in industrial works. They were expert miners. Um, as a matter of fact, um, is it on? It is on this map. Uh, if you look way up here, um, you see that mine right up towards the border, Arizonac? That's where we get the name Arizona from. And it was a silver mine discovered by Yaquis. Um, and so they're mining all across Sonora into Chihuahua. And of course, once there's, there's gold, silver, and copper mines that start popping up in Arizona, and they need labor, and who are the expert laborers just nearby? Yaqui Indians. And Yaquis, um, always willing to move and be mobile, um, 
eagerly go north and, and get jobs. Um, there's many times in which um, uh, mine owners even wrote specifically about how they wanted to have yaki workers, not Chinese laborers or laborers from Europe. They wanted the yaki miners because they were the most uh, valuable. They're doing the similar things um, with railroad projects and eventually all of the various canal projects across southern Arizona. Yaki labor is, is highly valued. So again, like that, the example up north, there's this early moment where their labor, their presence in the United States is welcomed and encouraged. We're trying to have them come north to help build up um, Arizona. All the while, there is this continued violence in Mexico. 1825, 1834, late 1850s, and then um, in the 1890s, um, region-wide warfare, uh, first of Spain, but then Mexico against the Yaquis. And all the while, I mean, this is just right across the border, so Arizona newspapers are reporting, I mean, national newspapers, everyone's talking about it, about, oh, there's another Yaqui war, another Yaqui revolt in Sonora and Mexico, because American newspapers really liked to look down their noses at Mexico and like to talk about, how, oh, Mexico can't keep their people under control. Mexico is being quite, is being barbaric in how they're treating these native peoples, always, you know, ignoring the fact of what we were doing north of the border. But, um, but because of this, Arizonans were nervous about Yaquis. We wanted their labor, but man, they've read a lot of stories in the papers about Yaqui violence, about them being warlike and, and, and fierce and, and you know, bellicose and so forth. So what does this mean for a Yaqui living in Arizona when warfare breaks out again in Sonora? What does this mean for the Yaquis north of the border? Do they want to stand up and let everyone know that they're Yaqui? Well, it maybe is how they've gotten their employment, but maybe not. So many of them, they, they try to lay low and they try to blend in with other immigrant communities. And this is gonna be a key point um, in, in the differences between how these two histories kind of roll, roll out. By the time we get to the turn of the century, um, Porfirio Diaz was uh, the president of Mexico, and um, the Diaz regime uh, declares a war of extermination against the Yaquis. Um, they wanted to clear the entire Yaqui River Valley out of Yaquis because it was a fertile river valley, and he wanted to industrialize it, uh, bring in large-scale agriculture, and modernize that region. Also wanted to... Uh, uh, attract uh, American investment into northern Mexico. And so beginning in 1887, they'd be, it, as a part of uh, the war, um, they're not just exterminating and killing Yaquis, but they're rounding them up, putting them uh, on trains, and then deporting them to the Yucatan, uh, to southern Mexico, and selling them into slavery um, to work on uh, plantations, um, in, in most, mostly in the Yucatan, but um, in, in Oaxaca and some other places as well. Here's what one observer uh, writes. Um, I saw one bunch of Indians brought from the interior to Guiamas, uh, that, uh, a port city, and was informed that they had been hauled um, 484 kilometers in stock cars, which had never been cleaned out after being used for transporting cattle. There were 1,500 of these poor devils, men, women, and children, huddled together in the cars like so many hogs. It was one of the most pitiful scenes I ever witnessed. The excessive summer heat and the closely packed Indians turned the boxcars into coffins. Every Yaqui had died before the port was reached. Um, I, I mean, I'm going to skip all of this. There, there's story after story of just the horrific um, brutality of the deportation, of the enslavement, and then in the Yucatan, of the slave labor. They die in uh, you know, tremendous numbers. There's talk of extinguishing a race um, of people. Well, these Yaquis had a history of mobility. And so when this violence, and they're used to violence, right? But this is now different. And uh, w uh, not just, they're trying, Mexico wasn't just trying to get them to sign a treaty, Mexico was trying to exterminate them, and then with the deportation and enslavement. Um, and they had this history with families and friends who for decades had been going north to Arizona. So what do a lot of them do in the face of this violence? They cross the border, right? Just as Crees had followed familiar trails and paths and come down to Montana, right, to escape violence. They are granted some nebulous form of unofficial asylum um, 
if they would register with the state in Arizona. Very few did because no one wanted to stand up and declare themselves as Yaki. And so they went on the underground. Um, and they blended in with existing Yaqui communities uh, and with uh, broader uh, Mexican and Mexican-American immigrant communities. When we get to the 1920s, when there's all kinds of immigration reform in the United States, their status is very unclear. Um, and many of them ha are, the, the state says you have to come forward and declare. But in a single Yaqui household, depending on when the, you know, you may have a multi-generational household, and depending on when they crossed, you may have someone who crossed at a point where they were going to be given a political refugee status. Someone who crossed a few years later who was also in that household maybe crossed a couple years too late and might be deported. And now you also have a generation or two of Arizona-born, American-born Yaquis, right? And so many, again, just tried to blend in and, and, and lay low. Well, unlike the um, Crees, um, they had been very successful in establishing communities. Right? They had valuable labor skills, and so they um, didn't own, often didn't own the land they lived on, but they had communities, neighborhoods. Um, if, anyone, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Tempe, Arizona, um, directly, I mean, now they, they all blend together, but right west of Tempe, Arizona is a small town called Guadalupe, which most people think of as a Mexican town. It was a Yaqui town, and it still is today. Um, there's, uh, it's kind of a trilingual English, Spanish, Yaqui uh, community. There were Yaqui settlements in Scottsdale, uh, in Chandler, Arizona, in Gilbert. Um, this is up in the Phoenix Valley. There was a Yaqui um, neighborhood um, about a mile and a half from where my wife grew up. And I, when I was doing this research, I said to my father-in-law, I said, hey, did you, did you know that those three streets down there uh, are Yaqui settlement? And there's these three streets that, um, it's Avenida Primera, Segunda, Tricera, like in Spanish. And they just always thought, oh, it's you know, a Mexican neighborhood. Um, and then down in Tucson, this map it's a little bit small, um, but uh, down in Tucson, um, that's where uh, the majority of them were in a number of communities. But you can see all these dots along the rail lines, um, along canal lines where they'd established communities. So interestingly, they had, they had economic skills that contributed to what Arizona was trying to, to do, right? building up industry, building up cities, infrastructure, and they could contribute to that. So they were able to um, have more stability than the Crees were. Um, uh, oh, let's see, oh, sorry, here's some, here's some zoomed in ones. These are all various Yaqui settlements in Tucson. This is what I should have shown you as I was trying to explain it all. And there's long histories that um, I talk about in the book of uh, land that was um, purchased by someone and held in trust for them, and they were allowed to stay on it, and then they lose those deeds, and they're moved around, all kinds of messy histories and similar things um, up in, up in the, the Phoenix, the Salt River Valley. Um, and this goes, uh, this goes on. It goes on for decades. They're in a very odd and precarious situation, as I noted, um, some are here, uh, some were many at that, you know, by the time, this is, uh, by the time we get to the 18, 1930s, 1940s, uh, many were now born here, right? And um, many are afraid of, of being deported. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff here so we can have time for Q&A, and I think you guys are more interested in the Montana stuff anyway. By the time we get to the 1960s, there are deep problems in these Yaqui communities, widespread poverty, and... Um, interestingly, though, remember uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, um, the Great Society? Some of you, I'm not going to accuse anyone here of being old enough to remember that, but I suspect that a few of you might remember that. Um, uh, there are all kinds of programs and funding available for communities to apply for grants and funding to build community centers, to um, improve health, education, all kinds of things, right? In inner cities, uh, poverty-stricken areas. Well. Um, there also were lots of specific programs for American Indians. But guess what? The Yaquis couldn't apply for them. They applied for grants from the Ford Foundation, all these different, you know, uh, large charities, and they were told, uh, sorry, uh, these are reserved for American Indians. Um, eventually, in the 1960s, um, they start to organize politically, and they form what was called the Pasqua Yaqui Association. And uh, it's, it was a nonprofit 
which then does fundraising, receives funding from the federal government as a nonprofit, and is able to purchase land outside of um, Tucson and to start to build an actual stable community that they owned. And this is where uh, the reservation is today. Um, uh, it's southwest of Tucson, um, Pasqua is what it's called. Um, and they go through lots of similar situations of local resistance, just like uh, Crees and Chippewas had here in Montana. But by the time they get to the 1970s, the Office of Economic Opportunity under Johnson was gone. All that federal funding had dried up, and they're left again on their own. And whereas before they had not pushed for federal tribal recognition, because if you remember in the 1950s and 60s, that was the era of termination, where the federal government was actively terminating tribal status. The, the U.S. government was not in the, the business of creating new tribes, right, in the 60s. And so they had um, been advised to don't, don't mention that. Don't, you need to actually explicitly say, we're not trying to be recognized. By the 70s, though, they've run out of options. And much as Crees did here in Montana, they start making allies with prominent Arizona citizens, um, some prominent academics, uh, anthropologist Edward Spicer and his wife Rosamond, um, uh, Morris K. Udall, a uh, senator from Arizona, really takes up the Yaqui case. Um, Carl Hayden from Arizona, another senator. And in very similar fashion as we saw in Montana, they're, you know, you know, one step forward, two steps back. They go through this long process and fight, and eventually in 1978, uh, secure federal tribal recognition, and which gives them access to other sources of funding and support for them to build up a stable community. Um, but again, 60 years after Crees and Chippewas had uh, attained federal tribal recognition in Montana. Um, today, both uh, these communities here in Montana and Arizona, they continue to maintain transnational ties with families uh, and, uh, you know, across the borders. So um, I've touched on a few comparative ideas that um, I'll kind of just uh, conclude with. Um, and actually, I think I'll, I'll skip over most of them. Um, but some key differences, labor, right? Yaquis had labor skills that allowed them uh, lots of economic opportunity, which allowed them to create um, kind of some more stable actual communities, right? Um, whereas Crees and Chippewas, uh, they, they didn't have that going for them. But ironically, since the Yaquis had more stable-ish communities, it allowed them to be ignored. Whereas Crees and Chippewas wandering around uh, landless uh, homeless uh, across Montana, they were conspicuous, they were visible. And in a, in a kind of a cruel, you know, twist of irony, um, I think led to them receiving recognition and reservation lands sooner. Because Montanans wanted to get rid of them. They wanted to just put, put them on a reservation, get them out of town. Here's what um, one observer writes, uh, this is Margaret Plassman. She says, nothing was done about um, the Cree and Chippewa state of affairs for a long time, although the Indians uh, um, were considered a nuisance. Not that they broke laws, um, stole and the like, for I never heard of any such charges being brought against them, although I will say those charges are being brought against them all the time in the newspapers. Um, um, but people, just I mean, listen to this, people were tired of seeing this poverty at their door and justly felt that some provision should be made for these exiles. So they... People were, they didn't want to see the suffering anymore. Um, well, for Yaquis in Arizona, the suffering wasn't quite as visible. Right? They had communities and neighborhoods that they were living in. They had jobs. Um, another uh, another uh, interesting wrinkle, which I didn't quite mention, I, I think I hinted at a little bit, is that uh, when Americans looked north and thought about Canadians and Canadian Indians, they saw two completely distinct populations, right? When they looked south and thought about Mexicans and Mexican Indians, most Americans didn't see as much of a difference, um, which allowed Yaqui Indians to blend in with Mexican and Mexican American communities, which at various points in their history in Arizona was very valuable that they could lay low and not be noticed. Ironically, by pretending to be the very people right, that they were trying to escape from. 
So some differences in kind of perceived ethnicity um, leads to some important differences in these two stories as well. Why should we think about um, this today? Um, uh, I don't think many of us would have to go very far back in any of our own family histories to find a story of people um, fleeing something, people moving for opportunity, uh, moving for safety, for protection, right? That, that's human history. It's a history of mobility. It's often a history of flight under duress. Um, uh, and, and in these stories, we have histories of people um, perishing um, in a land of plenty, um, suffering from inconsistent federal policies or just non-existent policies when there were very easy solutions um, to be found. Um, but instead, the United States ignored them or worse, harassed them, uh, deported them, or maybe just simply hoped that they would just go away or disappear. Actually, government officials are repeatedly saying, ignore them and they'll go away. Um, it was unnecessary. There were easy and cheap solutions, which is makes this um, difficult history to read. Um, I, 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 don't, I won't get on a, um, a contemporary soapbox for very long, but um, you don't have to look very far in the news today to find stories, not just of migration, but of all kinds of peoples who um, are falling through cracks, peoples who are suffering in lands of plenty, um, and for whom there could be solutions, maybe solutions that maybe won't be easy or cheap, but solutions that we could pursue. Um, and uh, I think it's incumbent on us uh, to do that, right? It's sad to, to read these kinds of stories and then to look at the news today and recognize that we've brought some of those horrors from the past fully into the present. We haven't solved these things yet. And we're still committing the same you know, horrible things that were done then. Um, uh, and, and I will say this, there still are um, unrecognized um, uh, native populations here in the United States. Little Shell, thankfully, is no longer on that list. But there still are many um, federally unrecognized indigenous communities uh, that, are, that are going through some of these same, same uh, struggles. So it's, it's my hope um, that we can use these kinds of messy and complicated and sometimes challenging histories to really to train ourselves to seek out people in need, uh, specifically those who are maybe being overlooked, um, and then hopefully um, give them the aid they need. So um, thank you for uh, your attention. I don't know if I went longer than I was supposed to on that, um, but I think we have time uh, for, uh, how much time do we have, Kirby, for questions? Okay, and, and at the end, again, I'm happy to, um, uh, if there's something different you wanna talk about, I'm happy to, uh, to stay and talk afterwards for a while. I have um, a box full of books if anyone wants, wants to buy one. Um, uh, yeah, qu um, questions. And um, I'll probably repeat your questions so that the live stream can, can pick it up. French name? They said, they, they said, I think it was the French trap, trapper and the uh, Indian name. And that's as much as I know. I know nothing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th th this, uh, across the Northern Plains. This is a, f a very familiar story. Crees, w with Crees, um, you know, whether you, call, whether you use the term Chippewa, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, um, uh, Assiniboines, Grovan, Blackfeet, many of them uh, were intermarrying with French traders, later Scottish traders and others. I mean, that's why we, how we get these Métis populations, which is different than just mixed heritage peoples. The Métis, you know, are a very specific, you know, um, ethnic uh, and cultural group. But, but it's, it's a very familiar uh, story. My grandmother would say, I'm going back east to visit family. She's going to Minnesota. To Minnesota. <laughs> Well, interesting. So um, when um, Nicholas of Rumen and I were up in Ottawa at that, um, uh, at this Métis symposium, and it was there with, I mean, all of the kind of the luminaries of Métis academics, Chris Anderson, Brenda McDougall, Nicole St. Ange, like if you've read any books about Métis history, you've, these, are the, these are the people writing about it. And we sat around for two or three days um, 
discussing all these things. And by the end, we were all kind of surprised by um, how um, multi-ethnic most of these populations were. And so, you know, as I'm you know, thinking about Little Bear or Rocky Boy, um, as they are talking with U.S. officials, and they're like, well, where were you born? Or what's your heritage? Where are, who are your parents and grandparents, right? And they're like, well, I'm Cree, um, but I have a grandmother who is Blackfoot, and uh, my great aunt was a Cinnabon, and, and this is the story with, with all of them. And then the Métis populations bring in, you know, French and other um, heritages as well. Um, it's not really till you know, Canada and the United States comes in and wants to sign treaties, and the nation state needs to define Okay, so who, who belongs in this group? And we need to define you as, you know, uh, Turtle Mountain Chippewas. And here's who belongs and who doesn't, right? And you are Chippewas. Sure, but they also have all kinds of other bloodlines as well. So the, the Northern Plains, it's, it's really challenging to try to figure out um, uh, genealogies uh, because they're just so, so intermixed. Not just with the French, but with, with each other as well. Oh my goodness. So, uh, well, again, the, the Métis and um, the Little Shell story, almost, almost entirely. Because um, they are, uh, what I ended up really uh, focusing a lot of the book on was um, those who were suffering from the prejudice of being a foreign Indian. And some of... Uh, Little Shell, Métis, and others didn't quite have that thrown at them quite as much, right? There were Métis who were living here since, you know, I mean, communities in the 1860s, like well-established Métis communities in Montana and in the Dakotas as well, right? Um, and so I really focused on, well, who are the specific groups that were suffering from the foreign uh, label? And that's why most of it focuses on the Cree story, and Rocky Boy and the Chippewas don't really enter until really late. I don't talk about their trek from, you know, Wisconsin, uh, you know, the Dakotas uh, westward. Um, there's, I mean, there's just so much. Um, I created a website, um, nativebutforan.org, where all, all of the stuff that I had to cut out of the book, I put on a website. And I, I integrated it into the footnotes. So, like, throughout the footnotes, you'll see, uh, for more information on X, Y, and Z, go to nativebutforan.org. And on there, there'll be... There's ways you can sort it by like, you know, chapter eight, footnote 34. And then here's like a few paragraphs of extra discussion and then, you know, like long lists of sources. Um, you know, when you do this research and if you slaved away for a whole week, you know, on this one little tidbit that you dug up in an archive somewhere, like, and then you have to like cut it out, it's, you know, killing your babies, right? Oh, that's, that's painful. And I was, you know, I had to cut, you know, 150 pages or so and I just didn't know what I was going to cut. And I said, you know what? I'll make a website. And so it won't be in the main text. But there were so many things that I think were valuable. You know, I had you know, pages that were all footnote <laughs> and no text. Because I just put so, all this extra stuff. Like, I dug this stuff up, and I, wanted, I want to make it available. And I didn't want to cut it. So I put it on the website. It made it a little bit less painful. Um, the other problem is that um, if you want to um, research Blackfoot history or, you know, Lakota history, you can go to um, the National Archives and they'll, in Re Record Group 75, they'll be really carefully organized, you know, uh, records for all these different tribal groups that had official treaty relationships with the United States. But for these Crees, Yaquis, and Chippewas, there's no such record groups. There's no such collections. And so finding their records... It, it, was, it was just a nightmare. They appear on the edges of other groups. They, you know. And so I had gone and dug up and located lots of things that, that had not been located before, which made me feel guilty about cutting stuff. I'm like, no, like this stuff, it's, it needs to be out there. Um, I think everyone feels like everything needs to be out there because we think our work is so important, but anyway. Um, yes, I mean, I have a long list of all the future books I'm going to write, you know, but we'll <laughs> probably never be able to get to. Um, I did write quite a bit uh, uh, for the Native American Rights Fund. 
um, but uh, they have control over that material, so I don't, I don't own that. Um, and I think at some point I'd like, I'll have a discussion with them and try to publish some articles. Um, uh, but, but also, um, I, I very much approach this project as a Western historian and a Borderlands historian, not as, um, not as I'm, 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 not, I'm not indigenous. Uh, I don't come from these communities. And I was not trying to write a community history. That's not my story to tell. Um, I wanted to write, I wanted to use their stories to understand something about the borders in the West, right? And so um, I, I would love to try to contribute, right, to, uh, to, to doing this, but um, that's the, you know, the Little Shell community, I would, they, they would need to take the reins on that, right? Um, and there's so much community knowledge and, uh, and, and knowledge within that cultural community that's not in the archives anywhere, right? Um, so they'd probably be better suited to write it. But, uh, but Nicholas Ruman's book is an excellent place to start. It's exhaustive in its, its coverage. Um, so many threads to, to address, but just one question. Um, the main key for my reading of Nicholas's book and others were a, were a significant, very significant economic force on the northern plains. Their fall and spring buffalo hunts, the Red River carts, this technology, you know, and that culture and cross the border frequently, right? Am I correct in that? Yeah. Back and forth. Following the herds. So, late 1800s, um, those herds were distinguished uh, by buffalo hunters and primarily all the flesh of the bones when they were turned into plastic um, fertilizers. And I think that you would find that they were significant. Indian figures that say we destroy the buffalo, we destroy the Indian. Yeah. I mean, it was an extermination strategy. They, they talked about that intentionally, right? Yes. Yeah. Do you think that that strategy is connected to establishment of the border? Uh, the strategy of eliminating uh, bison herds? Yeah, and, and then controlling the Indian. Tribe. Yeah, I mean, it's all. Of a piece. Yeah, it's, it's all part of the same. It's all part of the same story, right? Of, you know, as white settlement is moving out across the plains, native peoples need to be confined. And uh, the availability of you know, the bison herds is what allowed them to be so mobile out on the plains. I mean, remember that many of these plains tribes that we think about a few generations previous, um, they had a presence on the plains, but they came out to the plains uh, seasonally, right? where once they acquire horses uh, and some other technologies, they're on the plains full time, right? And once, Amer once uh, Europeans and Americans come in with the fur trade, they then go out there and engage in the fur trade full time. Um, so it, it was the presence of bison and other fur-bearing animals, right, that, that gave them such mobility and power uh, across the region. And so to uh, encourage white settlement, to control the border, uh, the bison had to go. Um, yeah, uh, I, and I would highly recommend, that there's a great book by um, uh, a historian, uh, Michel Hogue. He's a historian at Carleton uh, University up in Ottawa. He wrote a book called Métis in the Medicine Line, where he, uh, it won a lot of awards. Um, if you go to the Red Center's uh, YouTube channel, I, I brought him in for a talk, you can watch a talk that he gave, and he very convincingly argues um, about how powerful the Métis were across that border region, and that so many of the other histories that we think about on both sides of the border um, were actually being driven by Métis actors, and that the power of the Métis was what was driving so many uh, events and developments. From Nicholas's book, I find it very ironic that the leather produced by the hunting of the buffalo were used in part as transmission belts for machinery. So the Métis uh, um, harvest the buffalo, create this industrial society, which then destroyed them. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, cowhide, um, and I don't know the, the biology specifically, but it didn't hold up as well in this industrial treatment as like as, as belts on like, you know, steam engines and stuff. So the, the bison hide worked better. So in the steam shop, you would have water driven or coal driven engine that has a line shaft across the length of the shop. And wherever there's a machine, there's a transmission yeah. line of leather belt running that machine away to the line shaft. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about native peoples using bison, uh, you know, in so many ways and using it, you know, for, for clothing, uh, for, you know, uh, for, for shelter and so forth. And then those hides being harvested and then used, I mean, especially like in textile mills, to then make the textiles that this opposing civilization was using for those same purposes, right? There's, there's very, very unexpected intersections. Yeah, in the back. Yes, yeah, so Carlos Castaneda, um, this guy, he wrote this book, kind of, um, kind of like a new agey. I don't want, I don't want to. Um, yeah, magical realism, um, where he had talked to, he had, you know, had a, learned all this knowledge from a Yaqui elder who had had visions and so forth, and um, it's, it was, it was completely fabricated. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's interesting to think about why did he pick uh, the Yaqui, right? Um, it was an exotic nat indigenous people that had resonance. Like people for generations had heard about Yaquis as this fiercely, you know, like the last independent uh, indigenous nation, you know, in Mexico. Like, so the name ha ha meant, meant something because um, they could have picked any. And I think it's also interesting that they picked not a recognized American Indian tribe, right, that might in in some way, like, stand up and say, uh, no, no, right? Who had, like, an, a, a political voice in the United States. He chose to pick a group that was familiar but had no official political voice in a way. I don't know. But um, it was frustrating as a researcher when I'm trying to dig up stuff about Yaquis. Oh, my goodness. Castaneda, Castaneda keeps on popping up. <laughs> Thank you, thank you guys.